300 years, Americans have used mathematics as they conquered a continent and what the sea captain of an American clipper ship learned trigonometry for navigation. The surveyor used trigonometry to measure the land as the nation moved ever westward. Into the 20th century, logarithms were vital to the scientific and business calculations of a growing nation. But today, short computations are done on a desk calculator. Intricate computations are completed in seconds by automatic digital computing machines. And modern navigation is done by radar, LORAN, and radio direction finders. And scientific data, which today often assume astronomic proportions, are, through the use of logarithms, reduced to practical, workable form. So our uses of mathematics have increased and changed, and will change still further in the coming years. But does our math teaching reflect this explosive change in our civilization? Are we teaching the mathematics that will help our children meet the demands which lie ahead? Against the challenge of the future, how can we best teach mathematics for tomorrow? Like the modern science of which it is such an important part, mathematics is not a frozen or dead subject. It is a dynamic, changing field of human thought. And it has its innovators today as surely as in the past. Euclid and Newton enlarge our concept of the world through mathematics. But the ideas of recent mathematicians, such as John von Neumann, Hermann Weyl, and Oswald Veblen, continue to influence our thinking about mathematics and its uses in our world. Modern research in mathematics has kept pace with and helped make possible advances in transportation, medicine, and space science. More mathematics has been discovered in the past 50 years than in the entire 2,500 years of past mathematical history. And the rate of discovery increases yearly. Findings in linear programming permit executives to increase the efficiency of their business operations. Boolean algebra plays an important role in the design of electronic circuits, such that a telephone dialed in San Francisco can, in a matter of seconds, be connected to a customer in New York. The almost instantaneous calculations necessary to control a space vehicle in flight would be impossible without high-speed computers. In such a changing scientific world, it is not surprising that the number of workers needing mathematical skills is increasing. Since 1910, the number of skilled workers in this country as compared to the total labor force, has increased from about one-third to nearly one-half. And each of these skilled workers now needs a greater competence in the use of mathematics. In such a world, the student who avoids high school mathematics may well find himself among tomorrow's unemployed. Entrance into the professional world requires a college education. And the college graduate, without an adequate knowledge of mathematics, will find many attractive careers closed to him. It is not enough for today's children to learn today's mathematics by rote memorization. These children will face problems tomorrow that are unknown today. We cannot teach them specific answers to these unknown questions. We must teach them the basic ideas that will help them solve these new problems. Will they become scientists, salesmen, or housewives? Even if they do not yet know what they want to be, our children deserve the finest education in mathematics which is possible. Anything less will not serve the demands of tomorrow.
For our schools, this means that there must be new approaches to mathematics teaching if we are to prepare today's children to meet tomorrow's problems. Fortunately, there are now a number of promising new approaches to mathematics. Much work has been and is being done in this area, and many new programs and new textbooks are being produced. One program alone involved the efforts of over 150 writers, including research mathematicians and teachers from elementary and secondary schools, colleges, and universities. Commission on Mathematics, SMSG, UICSM, Maryland, Ball State, Greater Cleveland, Stanford, Minnesota, there are many new initials, many names, many systems of mathematics education but they do have much in common. And these elements represent a new influence in the modern classroom. In every new mathematics approach, there is an increased emphasis on basic concepts, those principles that underlie all mathematical skills and reasoning. As an example, in Mrs. Martha Gilman's first grade class at El Monte School, children are learning about sets. All right, now let's find out what I have in this sack. Here's something you can eat in this sack. What do you suppose I have in this sack? What do you think, Greg? Candy. No, not candy. It's something that's even better for your teeth than candy. What do you think, Cam? Sandwich. No, I have... That's right, too. I have a whole set of apples in that sack. They're real. Rita asked a good question. Are they real apples? They are real apples. All right. Now, I would like you to just use your eyes and look around our room and see if you can find any other sets of things in our room and then raise your signal if you can find some other sets of things in our room. Luana. The set of charts on the blackboard? Good. Anybody else find some sets of things in our room? Lewis. The numbers are being up, the yellow circles in the back, up behind the blackboard. I don't know which thing you're pointing to here. You mean the set of papers in our room? Yes, the set of papers behind us on the wall, Toby. Teaching the simple concept of set can lead children to gain a clearer insight into numbers. They learn that the property of threeness is what the set of apples and the mixed set share in common. Are the members in this set the same as the members in this set? Are they the same thing? Do I have apples over here? Are the members the same then? No, Greg, you keep shaking your head yes. The members aren't the same, they all decided. Why are you shaking your head yes, Greg? What is the sa Is there something the same about these two sets? Jerry, what's the same about these two sets? Yeah, we said the members were different, but there's something the same about these two sets. Rita, what's the same? How do you know we have three things, Rita? No, but how can you tell? How could you tell? You told me they both have three members. Each set has three members. How could you tell? How could you tell that each set has three members of things in it there? Lewis, how could you tell? Because they look the same. They look the same. You can just kind of look at those two sets, can't you, and tell that they both have three members in them. All right, but now I have something that's a little harder. I have a can of erasers. And in my can, I have a whole set of erasers. And in this can, I have a set of crayons. Now, you can't see, you can't see the sets inside my can, so you can't tell if these sets match or not because you can't see inside. How am I going to find out if I have the same amount of members in the set in this can 
as I have in the set in this can. Jan Google, how am I going to find out? Open the top. Open the top and the Oh, I, how would I pull them out? How would I find out if this set has the same amount of members as this set? How would I, Eddie, how would I find it? Match them. Good for you. Eddie, can you do that for us? In classes like this, children learn the process of matching or one-to-one -one correspondence, which can lead from concrete examples to the great abstractions that numbers are. To gain a clear understanding of mathematics in today's world, we need to re-examine some old ideas. In the past, we assumed that we knew all about numbers when we had learned the fundamentals of our decimal system with its base of tens. Yet we use ten as a base probably because each of us has ten fingers, and arithmetic used to be done by counting on one's fingers. Now, however, other bases such as two, eight, and twelve often are more convenient. Today's computers, for example, use a number system to the base two, which involves only two numerals, zero and one, in place of the ten numerals from zero to nine, which are necessary for numbers written in the decimal system. Today, in many schools, children are learning how to write numbers through various bases. Mr. Al Zamolo's fifth grade class is learning the fundamentals of base five. Hi. They have recalled that in the familiar base 10 system, the symbol 1 2 means 1 10 plus 2 ones, or 12. The 1 denotes how many tens, and the 2, how many ones. In base 5, the same symbol, one two, means one five plus two ones, which is seven. Similarly, in base ten, the symbol two three means two tens plus three ones, or twenty three. In base five, the same symbol two three means two fives plus three ones, which is thirteen. Through learning to develop number systems with different bases, children gain a better understanding of the positional nature of the familiar decimal system. In addition to re-examining old ideas, the new mathematics teaching includes introduction of new subject matter, particularly in the upper grades of high school. In many schools, seniors are now studying the laws of probability and statistical analysis. Dealing with such advanced subject matter challenges the creative teaching abilities of high school mathematics teachers like Mr. Robert E.K. Rourke. Now this morning, I want to discuss a probabilistic model for finding a needle in a haystack. Now perhaps I should say a needle in a needle stack, and here it is. This container has a great many machine parts. They all look exactly alike. But the fact of the matter is, they are not exactly alike. Three or four mixed in here at random have been made by a special precise process that's very costly. Now, I can't find these three or four special items by looking, but I can find them by testing. The test takes time and money. Here's the question. Should I test or should I go out and buy a new one? Now, in order to answer this question, among other things, I'd like to know this. On the average, on the average, how many of these will I have to test before I find a special? Well, now the probabilistic model that I have for solving problems of this type is a very simple one. An ordinary deck of cards. I use the four aces in the deck for special items. And I use the rest of the deck, the 48 non-aces, for non-special items. And I'm going to approach this probabilistic model in the usual way, from three points of view. We'll find out from it what we can by guessing, we'll find out what we can by experimenting, and finally, we'll apply our theoretical mathematics to the model. Now, I'm going to describe an experiment for you. I want you to follow me closely, and then at the end, I want you to guess the outcome of this experiment. I'm going to put one needle in the haystack, one ace in the stack. I'm going to shuffle thoroughly. I'm going to count 
until I find that ace. I'm going to notice its position number. Then I'm going to repeat the experiment a hundred times. I'll have a hundred position numbers. I will average them all, and I will get the average position of the ace. Now, there are 48 non-aces in a row. Where would you expect, on the average, to find that ace? Henry? Oh, come on, guess. The guesses are free. Where would you expect to find it? Well, Henry, would you expect to find it near the front, on the average? Near the back? Alice, where would you expect to find it? Exactly. Near the middle. There's some symmetry involved in this, and we sort of feel in our bones that that ace is going to divide the 48 string into two equal parts. 24 in the first part, so somewhere around position 25, we expect to find our ace. I add another needle to the haystack. I performed... Mr. Rourke goes on to lead the students to guess that two aces will divide the pack, on the average, into three approximately equal parts. Three aces into four approximately equal parts. And four aces into five approximately equal parts. So much from guessing. Now we want to try the experimental part of our program. I want everybody tonight to do this experiment with the four aces 20 times. Get me 20 position numbers for the first ace. From the whole class, that will give us about 300 position numbers, and we will see if experiment backs up what we found by guessing. And then tomorrow we'll do the most interesting part of all. We'll apply our theoretical mathematics to this problem. Not only has the content of the new mathematics been enlarged, but methods of teaching this content are improving. Replacing the old authoritarian method of teaching by rote memory is teaching for understanding. One such technique is the discovery method, which is explained by a teacher in this way. A few years ago, I would teach a mathematical lesson by telling the students the rule or the formula that I wanted them to learn. I'd tell them why it worked. I might even prove it to them. I'd work out some examples. And then I'd tell them to work some problems just like I had done. But this is kind of like uh, reading the last chapter of a mystery story and then trying to enjoy reading the rest of the story. Uh, it kind of takes the fun out of it. By using the discovery method, the students have the suspense and the excitement of having come to the discovery themselves. Uh, they get to be the hero rather than the teacher telling them what it is they need to know. Uh, they discover for themselves the rules and the formulas, and so they remember them better. It's their own experience rather than merely just a lesson. Putting these ideas into practice in his seventh grade class, Mr. Clayton Ross of Glenbrook Intermediate School uses the discovery method in an actual learning situation. The class has established that consideration of volume adds the dimension of height or depth to their previous discussions of area. The problem now is how to find the volume of a right rectangular prism. Let's try this one, Don. Judy, what would you say is the length? Um, two cubes. Three. What would you call the width? Um, two. All right. What would you say is the height or depth? Two. All right. And what do you think is the volume there? Um, twelve. Twelve. Uh, you agree to that? Do you think it's twelve, uh, Candy? Yes, I do. You think it's twelve, uh... Uh, Nancy, what would you say is the volume there? How many cubes in the whole thing? In the whole thing? On um, the whole thing. In the whole rectangular solid. You can't see all those cubes. Some are down underneath the stack there. 28. 28, huh? Um, let's see. Uh, Todd, how many cubes does it look like to you are in the whole stack? You think there are 12 there? All right, Tim. Um, oh, how about you, Judy? We haven't given you a chance. Twelve. About twelve. All right. Well, uh, we don't all agree, but we kind of get the idea, many of you seem to think there are about twelve cubes there. If, if this was, uh, well, say what? Why don't we do it this way? Here are these cubes you people made. Let's stack it up just like in the picture. Let's see. Three along like this. Yeah. <laughs> 
Is that about like the picture? Yeah. Let's see, we've got the length of three. There's three cubes along that way. Width two, two along this way. Depth two. Now we got a height or depth of two there. Uh, and let's see. Well, that makes six cubes right there in that top layer. Six more in the bottom layer. So, uh, 12 right now. Okay. Thank you, Don. We've done this several times now, people. We've done it with a number of pictures. We've got the information tally on the board. Does anyone see any kind of a, a rule or a relationship between these numbers, the length, the width, and the depth, and the, the number we wrote down for the volume? What do you see, Todd? You multiply the first two numbers, then take the third number and multiply the answer Todd has proposed a rule for finding the required volume. Does the rule always work? The members of Mr. Ross's class now check the rule and assure themselves that it always gives the correct volume. They have discovered the solution to their problem. The discovery method, a very important method of teaching mathematics. While no one method holds all the answers, many teachers like Mr. Ross are achieving excellent results with this technique. These, then, are some of the ideas which underlie the new approaches to mathematics. There are many new systems for teaching mathematics, but they share a common emphasis on the basic ideas and concepts of mathematics. And this emphasis already is bearing fruit in the improved quality of preparation of high school graduates. At the same time, extensive tests indicate that this gain in concepts is without loss in basic skills. There are additional indications that as teachers become better acquainted with the new programs, student skills will be increased still further. One reason for the success of these programs in mathematics is the increased interest and enthusiasm of both teachers and students. This enthusiasm on the part of the teachers is not because the new mathematics is easier to teach. Any teacher who has used these techniques will testify that at first it takes more work. Of course, for the pupil, the new approaches are no more difficult than the old. For while these new approaches are new to parents and teachers, any approach is new to the student. Hence, it may look much more difficult to the parent who learned his mathematics some years ago than it does to the enthusiastic student who is learning it for the first time. For principals with today's scheduling problems, these advantages of the new mathematics teaching can be obtained without taking additional time in an overcrowded school curriculum. Through better organization, selection, and coordination of material, and through more effective teaching, more mathematics education is being achieved in the same amount of school time. Is it worth it? Does it work? Here are comments from some of those involved in new programs. Mr. James A. Robinson, principal of San Francisco's Bret Hart School. As a school principal, I have found that the new mathematics programs can be very successful. Our major difficulty at first stemmed from the doubts of the teachers and parents. But once we had shown them what was involved, they became our most firm supporters. In many localities, there are classes for parents using the new approach. In these instances, the parents have become almost as enthusiastic about it as the mathematics supervisors themselves. Miss Mary McDermott, curriculum consultant for the Mount Diablo Unified School District. With proper coordination and planning on the part of administrators and teachers, the new programs work very well. Teachers and students are excited about their work, and we see a new spirit of accomplishment in our mathematics classes. 
We have found that it is most unwise for a teacher without special preparation to attempt to teach any of the new material. However, there are many opportunities to receive this training through written material, through special institutes, also, our state supervisors of mathematics and the university professors have been most useful in helping teachers handle the new materials. We strongly feel that a well-prepared teacher is the secret to the success of any of the new mathematics programs. And what about the college freshmen who have been students in these programs? Dr. Carl Allendorfer, professor of mathematics at the University of Washington, makes this comment. We at the University of Washington are very much pleased with the recent improvement in the mathematical training of our incoming students. More and more our freshmen are able to start their college mathematics at the collegiate level, and fewer and fewer are required to study high school mathematics at the remedial level while they are at the university. This great improvement in the mathematical ability of our students is especially marked in the case of our most able young people. These honor students, as freshmen, are now mastering material which I myself first understood when I was a graduate student. We are therefore strong backers of the new high school mathematics programs and are supporting them in every possible way. Genuine reactions to the revolution in mathematics education. The new programs include development of basic concepts, re-examination of old ideas, introduction of new important topics, and new methods of instruction aimed at teaching for understanding. These new and better approaches to mathematics are being developed and are used in many schools. And none too soon, for the need is urgent, and tomorrow will not wait. What about the children in your school? Will they be as well prepared as they should be to face the complex world they will inherit? Is their mathematics education the best it can be? Is your school teaching mathematics for tomorrow? <laughs>